we have this um, devaluation, this extreme devaluation. And then in the 1930s, when we have this devaluation, we get these new ther therapies that enter as silent medicine. They're insulin coma therapy, they're metrazole convulsive therapy, and electroshock and ultimately lobotomy. Um, these were all seen as highly effective therapies. If you read the press in the United States at this time, Reader's Digest, it was that madness has been discovered. You can run someone through convulsive therapy and um, it just eliminates the madness. They, talk, they sit up, they talk sense, boom, this is like this extraordinary medical advance. Electroshock, by the way, do you know this was invented basically as a better way to do convulsions than using metrazole, which was a poison? It really was started partly as a more con more consistent way to cause these convulsions were thought to induce seizures, which were thought to drive out um, schizophrenia. High, a judge to be highly effective, uh, seen as miracle brain surgery. Then lobotomy comes in. Uh, lobotomy, of course, is invented by a Portuguese uh, neurologist, Miguel Moniz, um, 1939. He also you know, when he writes it up, he talks about people restored to sanity right away. We get in the United States a guy named Walter Freeman, who starts going around to, uh, to uh, hospitals around the country. He perfected a technique for doing lobotomy in about 10 minutes. He would drive ice picks through the eyes, he would lay the person out, and they would just literally, Walter Freeman would go into a hospital, review the medical records, and he'd pick out, say, 50 people to do the surgery that morning, and they would run them up one by one, and the table, he would drive the ice picks in, scramble the lobes, and the ideas, they would go away cured. Just a question. <laughs> the important thing here is, by the way, Marion told me, if you go long tonight, you're yanked off the stage, so I better hurry up. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what the food's about? 10 minutes, how fast? 10 minutes. All right, so 10 minutes. Um, anyway. Um, the New York Times, when I was writing about the body, said these new surgeons have learned to neatly pluck madness from the brain as cleanly as they were like watchmakers. They knew all the inner, inner workings of the brain, they figured out where madness was located, and they said the frontal lobes, it seems, are a useless appendage. They don't really lose anything when you knock out the frontal lobes, but madness goes. In the United States, where we again are real pioneers of lobotomy, you can read people say that lobotomy can only help. Sometimes it doesn't work, it's, it's ineffective. But really, if you look at when they first did the assessments, there were three assessments. Ineffective, no harm done, so-so, and miracle surgery. So it became the scene of something of a, uh, a no-risk surgery. And there was time that was even recommended for young women in college that were just feeling a little bit depressed. And you can read the, the things, they were young, it was women more. The women were told to bring in uh, sunglasses. You could come in, have your frontal lobes scrambled, and then go away for the day. And just so you know this, that there's a little bit of thing here. So in 1949, Yasmin Lees wins the Nobel Prize in Medicine for inventing this miracle of surgery. So what's going on here? How come was it seen as so effective? Well, you gotta read the text by Walter Freeman. Because Walter Freeman did great follow-up work, fantastic follow-up work. And here's what he said. These people, in essence, don't have much worth at the beginning, right? So he would say, if we change this person who's sort of psychotic and difficult into some, if we knock them down to a lower level, sort of like a level of a domestic pet, well, that was seen as a, a, a good outcome. So if we could take someone who was agitated in the hospital and allow them to go home and sort of stare out the window, that was good. And that became part of their, the way they assess the value. And you can read things where they say like, you know, these people used to worry about like, what the history of America might have been like if the Indians had won or something like that. Or these people might have used to play these piano concertos. And now they just mostly sit quietly and look out the window. That's a good change. But you can see there's a value uh, underlying this assessment. 
real quickly, I've got about eight minutes. Um, when the antipsychotics first come in to uh, introduce them to asylum medicine, they were seen as providing a chemical lobotomy that transforming people in a somewhat similar way that the surgery did. There's a, a, a reason for that. Um, Torazine and other standard neuroleptics, what they do is they profoundly block dopamine in the brain. The frontal lobes work off of a dopaminergic pathway, so if you're profoundly blocking that, you are diminishing frontal lobe function. All right, so that brings us to the modern era. <clears throat> you can see, actually, when you look at it this way, there is a bit of a connection. See this? I mean, in other words, the drugs initially are seen as not as antipsychotics, but providing this sort of same change. It's in the early 1960s. A study is done by the NIMH, and they say, wow, it's a classic randomized trial, six-week trial. It's 250, no, 300 patients, nine hospitals, three groups get drugged. One group placebo, they say after uh, six weeks, the drug-treated patients, in fact, the psychotic symptoms have abated much more than in the drug-treated group. And they say, ah, these drugs aren't just tranquilizers. Major tranquilizers, they're antipsychotics. In other words, they're fixing something wrong in the brain. They're like an antidote, like an antibiotic. And this is the moment we get new language. And we get the launching of the psychopharmacological revolution. We get antipsychotics. We get antidepressants, and we get anti-anxiety agents. And now it fits into the antibiotic model of medicine. It is key to remember here, antibiotics come in after World War II. And they do transform medicine. Think about this. We have these bacterial infections that uh, you can now knock out. You have magic bullets. And so everybody wants their magic bullets. I completely understand this. And these were psychiatry's magic bullets. And if you can read conventional histories of psychiatry, such as, and this is in the UK as well as the US, but in the US it's a book called The History of Psychiatry by Edward Shorter. He says, the introduction of Thorazine, and I say Thomas, was as profound a leap forward in psychiatry as the introduction of penicillin was in infectious medicine. So this extraordinary leap forward, extraordinary increase, and this launches this revolution, it makes it possible to empty the institutions. You go forward with this story of the psychopharmacological revolution, and you can see this, for example, in a book or a, a publication done by our U.S. Surgeon General in 1998, who's David Satcher. He says, prior to 1955, we lacked treatments that would prevent chronicity, prevent people from becoming chronically ill. Then we got these drugs, and now we have this vast array of safe and effective treatments. And then he says this revolution has unfolded in two stages. We got the first generation drugs. Then in 1988, we got Prozac and the SSSRIs. You call it Prozac in, in, in Europe, that's yeah. right. And then we got the atypical antipsychotics, Risperdal. And then we got the new, the better Benzo, supposedly. And therefore, this revolution has two steps. First drugs, and then we have these better drugs. And these better drugs arose from an understanding of the advancing knowledge about the biology of mental disorders. Great story, fits into the story of medical progress. And now I'm just about to leave you, so what do I do in anatomy of an epidemic? As a first step, if there's medical progress, you should expect the burden of mental illness on society to drop or at least stay the same. Because that's what normally happens when you get effective treatments for medical disorders. So what I did is the opening chapter is just look at the number of people on government disability from 1955 forward. And look at that as a per capita rate. In 1955, there were 560,000 people in the United States in state and county hospitals. You've got to look, however, how many people had psychiatric diagnoses. It's about 360,000 people. That's a disability rate of about one in every 480 people. Now we do deinstitutionalize during that time, and now let's go to and now the disabled mentally ill, quote, disabled mentally ill in the United States are kept on SSI and SSDI. This is a federal uh, support program. You get a government check. I'm sure you have your own disability program. In 1987, that had grown to 1.25 million people during this first stage of the revolution, and that's a disability rate of about one in 180 people. So it's more than two times higher. 
Now, people might say, oh, that's an apples to oranges comparison. You had to be sick or to be in the hospital. Maybe you don't have to be a sick, so maybe that's not fair, okay? From 1987 forward, we had the same metric, right? We're not switching metrics. 1987 is when we really embraced the use of medications as the cornerstone of care. In the United States, our spending on psychiatric drugs rose from $800 million in 1987 to more than $40 billion in 2007. So we really love these new drugs. <laughs> what happens to the disability numbers? They go from 1.25 million to 4 million. They triple during that time. That's a, at a per capita rate, it drops to about 1 in 70. How about the shareholders really like that? What's that? How about the shareholders really like that? The shareholders do like that. But you see why this raises a puzzle? Instead of seeing the burden of mental illness decreasing, it's rising. And notably so. So the disability rate's about six times it, what it was in 1955. Now, just in, I knew this data before I came somewhat, but I also looked at it a bit more. Iceland, <coughs> which was my first stop on this tour, saw the uh, same sort of thing from 1976 to 2000, a doubling of the disability rate. But you know what's really happened in Iceland? Antidepressants became real popular in Anna, and, and you can look at the numbers beginning in about 1995. Since 1995, the incidence rate, the number of people going on disability each year in Iceland among adults, has tripled since 1995 to 2008, whatever it was. So antidepressants come in, and all of a sudden, the, the disability rate, the number going on disability, has tripled. Here in Britain, it tripled between 1985 and. 85, you have a measure something called days lost or something like that due to disability. It tripled between 1985 and 1995. I unfortunately I haven't seen your updated data, but I'm quite sure it is continuing to rise. And actually, you see this in country after country where the drugs become the cornerstone of care. By the way, it's not just psychotic disorders. Whenever you see the countries embrace this preventive care. It's actually the mood disorders that really rise as a disability problem. It's depression, and then the other thing that you see with the widespread use of uh, antidepressants is a bipolar group springs up. Suddenly bipolar becomes much more prevalent. Bipolar becomes a big driver of uh, disability data. We'll talk about why that is. Finally, last thing, remember that how I got started with uh, the good outcomes in the four countries? Uh, Eli Lilly now has a new study of about 7,000 patients. As you know, psychiatry has been globalized. So since, since we're so good in the United States, we've been promoting the use of medications in Asia and Africa. They really want to be developed. They want you to develop. And we bring their doctors to our meetings each year, and they go back, and this is the latest medicine. Well, the outcomes for schizophrenic psychotic patients in the poor countries of the world are now deteriorated to where they're basically like they are in the U.S. and other developed countries.